All right, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is Como High Performing Arts Auditorium and Performing Arts Instructional Spaces. Uh, Kyle, are you going to handle this? Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the Finance Committee. Kyle Bordlaw, Director of Planning and Facilities. Um, after many discussions with other staff members about the Como High Performing Arts Auditorium, uh, we spoke to the architect, Mr. Eric Crozier, who's been working on some preliminary information for us, and he's made some adjustments to previous uh, numbers that he's worked up from previous uh, presentations, and I'd like him to give you that information at this time. Good afternoon. Uh, I got a PDF up here. Uh, Eric Crozier, Abel Crozier Davis Architects. Um, can everybody see the PDF? Okay. Let's see if I can. Look at that, Justin. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, what we were asked to look at was uh, a going from an 800 seat to a 500 seat auditorium, and then some other suggestions um, that we could look at to try to reduce those costs. So the first PDF is an option two, phase one. Phase one is still the phase that contains the um, performing arts. Phase two, which is the PDF that I haven't opened yet, yet is, the, um, is the next phase. So let me get that one open before we go full screen. See if we can do that. Maybe we can figure out a way to toggle between the two. Uh, view full screen so this is option two phase two so this happens to be the one that includes the suites but does not include the auditorium it's assuming that the auditorium is built at another time um, so let me see if we can figure out a way to jump back to the other one apologize this is phase one and we'll do the adjusting trick and we'll go full so what we did was when we looked at this the ones in gray again are a part of phase two so you really don't have much here on the first phase that's in uh, phase one here's phase two so you'll see uh, auditorium seating it's about a hundred square feet per person is the formula so when you have 500 seats you're roughly 5,000 square feet the other thing we did was uh, looking at the lobby if we reduce the square footage of the 800 seats then we probably didn't need a lobby that was quite as large as we had for eight 800 seats to a 500 so we reduced that some this also still includes the black box theater in this version option in this phase option one the black box could be moved out of here and put into uh, the second phase, which would be with the other suites, if uh, the school system would think that would be necessary or an idea that we could pursue, rather. So what we did was that that cut four point uh, one point four million out of the budget. So we're right at ten million by going from eight hundred to five hundred seats. Um, things that that changed whenever you were on a a fee curve so the designers fee we re-looked at that and adjusted it it went up a little bit because the project scope went down um, we also divided out and put in an, uh, a little bit of money for AV and acoustical we split that out and added a little bit to that because there were we, we did get in, in looking at that was something that I wanted to add in from previous estimates you'll also notice probably shouldn't bring this to your attention but I'm gonna the cost whenever you go down in square footage like we did we took the seats out but we still have dressing rooms and we still have the offices and we still have a 
um, backstage in a 4,000 square foot stage. We have a lot of those spaces still in. They're all still in. I believe that your cost per foot was, is going to go up a little bit. So from 325, the cost per foot goes to 340. That's you know based on the history of what we would see. If you would if you would scale that again, you've got a 4,000 square foot stage in all the back of the house, and you have 100 seats. That would make sense that that wouldn't be 325 a foot anymore. It would be even more than that. So the seats, however expensive they are from a volume and acoustical standpoint, there are other parts of that building that are going to hold that price a little bit higher. I think that was about $200,000 is when, when we go up. So, you know, maybe we would run into a favorable market like we probably are in now. Maybe we can get that back. But, you know, that I think that was something that that would be, that's the way I would approach it, and I, I, that's the way I would probably recommend it. I think our cost would go up slightly for those spaces. So anyway, we're looking at a cost of uh, from 11.4 million to right at $10 million. That it still includes a 4.5% contingency that you'll see at the bottom of uh, your soft costs. Now, um, let me jump over to phase two option two phase two so again here's your suites your band suite coral suite most of those existing spaces already exist and we we were just adding some storage rooms and there's those didn't change uh, the gray is of the auditorium which is in phase one your dance suite is here we did not adjust this very much at all um, the request was or one of the ideas was, hey, can we take, you know, I, I think it's going from 500 seats, from 800 to 500 seats is like a 37% difference. <clears throat> it didn't cut 37% of the money, it cut 15% of the money. So could you come in and could you take 15% out of all of these support spaces or take 30% out of all these support spaces? You could. Uh, my fear would be that you would end up with spaces that wouldn't be as usable or functional for strings or suites or dance if you cut across the board a certain percentage. You could. I think you'd have to study that a little bit more in your floor plan whenever you started laying it out. At that point, I think my recommendation might be, why don't we look at a suite? If you cut a suite, leave the infrastructure, the size of the rooms, the way the recommended size would be, could we find a suite that we could remove and then add that suite back again later? Like, you know, a dance suite. You know, maybe you take the dance out. That dance is worth $1.6 million. What if the dance came out, left, you left everything else the same, and then when you found the one6 you could build the dance suite? Um, I, we've seen it happen before where you sort of you take a percentage out of everybody, and maybe what we end up with is everybody's space has become maybe awkward, or maybe they don't become as usable as they could have been long term. So those are kind of some of the decisions that can be made. But I think I would like to see the, the, the school system make those decisions in conjunction with a programming effort that's specific to this exercise when it comes to the floor plan. You know, can we, can we look at how many pianos can we get in a certain size piano suite? And maybe we can look at some of those options if you wanted to cut more of a percentage out of each one. Uh, just uh, my opinion about that. So this actually didn't change much at all. Basically stayed at 5.7. If you did look at the suites, however, you can see what the values were, these tentative values before you add soft costs to them. You know, the dance suites, 5,000 feet, it's worth 1.6 million. And then you'd have the attributable soft costs that are down below assigned to that too, so your cut would be a little bit more than that 1.6, roughly, say, 20%. So, um, you know, that's something for us to look at, I think, as a group uh, that, we could, you, that we could study those. Um, you could also move the black box from phase one into phase two. It's roughly a million dollars. So we could drop the phase one down to roughly nine million plus soft costs and then add it to this or even add it as a third phase. You know, we got phase one, phase two already. You know, is there something that makes sense that might be a third phase? 
for that academy. So, did you have any specific questions, or did you want me to go back to another sheet? Would you go back what you said just now, the nine million plus soft costs? Would you go back to page three of, I guess it's phase one? Sure. Were the soft costs not the soft costs were included in the ten point oh, right? Correct. Okay. All right. When yeah. you said but, not, when you said nine plus soft costs, you meant nine including soft costs. Yes. Yeah. Well, like up here, so the it was nine ninety eight, nine hundred ninety eight thousand. Theaters, nine, that's construction costs. So if you remove that, you would actually remove that plus its associated soft costs down here at the bottom. It actually be a little more. Okay. You'd probably be like one point two, one point one, something like that, that you would migrate from one to another. So you would you would be below, right at or just slightly below nine million if you took the black box theater out. But that's something that we probably should. Is it recommended or is it, you know, as long as it was planned right to go back in later on in a, in, a, in an easy way, I think you could plan it out correctly. How how big is the black box theater? Go back to that page, please. It was. 2,400 square feet. So is, does that mean 30 seats, something like that? Uh, well, it depends on the size. Oop, I'm sorry, the event. Yeah. You it's know, it's not it was, big. I understand It that. is not yeah. right. Yeah. I don't know that you'd get 100, 150 people in there, depending on the event that you would have. Okay. And how interchangeable are these uh, individual projects you know I think we've covered before like you've broken it up nicely but you then you say we maybe we move the black box into this phase um, how interchangeable are they how much build for the future do we have to take into account if we were to go a certain direction in in my discussions with Michelle at Pfluger you know the black box is something that you you could probably migrate over to another phase Phase three gets to be, I, I, and I see what she's talking about, it becomes difficult to prove a need sometimes. You know, it, it, oh, we, we're, we're, get, we're getting used to just practicing here. Or we're getting used to practicing here, and it's not in that black box environment for a performing arts academy. Um, it would make some sense that if phase two was first and the black box went with it, you could do some performance there. You could do some practicing there. You could do a lot of practicing there in that black box. And, and if, because I think some of the discussions have been, we have other places to have a, a theater presentation. You know, we have other schools that have a theater now. The black box being in phase two might support, you know, some of that idea that you build the black box with the band suites and some of these other educational areas. Um, and of course, when you say that, you mean building phase two first. If it was built first, okay. right. Okay. If you built phase one first, um, I think ideally you would leave the black box with the performance theater and build it in that phase. Um, but I really, in talking with Michelle and, and kicking some other ideas around, I think we could make it work pretty effectively if it was migrated into another phase. Uh, some of the other spaces, though, like say the, um, you know, there's some obvious spaces that just need to stay with the auditorium. You know the scenery work areas, the backstage efforts. You know those kinds of things. Naturally, would probably want to stay with that. Um, you know, a four thousand square foot stage is probably not something that we would recommend that we adjust the size of. Um, regardless, if you had one seat, you'd want four thousand square feet. If you had eight hundred, you'd have four thousand square feet. So I think we would want to leave that consistent. There's been some discussions whether or not we need a concession area. If we don't, that's ninety-five thousand. Yeah, you know, we can use that somewhere else. Can you go back to phase two for me, please? Sure. That's just on Mr. Bruce. Or do you have any questions? Oh, no. I know we're looking at economics going from 800 to 500. My train of thought is we got to laugh yet high 
and then when it, when it was built, it was adequate at the time. But now we finding that it's it's not. So I don't want to go back. I don't want to look up five, six years from now and say we should have added the 300 seats instead of trying to save a dollar today it costs us two dollars tomorrow. Right. And and that's my train of thoughts. It's that um, in five or ten years, how much more would it cost us? Just just to guess, to add 300 seats to go up to a larger capacity, a couple of four or five million dollars when we're trying to save a million dollars a day? If you didn't plan it right, I'm not sure you could. I mean, you'd, you'd have to put the footprint and the infrastructure in to do it now. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, that's where you're going to spend your money anyway. So I don't think you would save, if your footprint was big enough to do 800, really all you did was take out the seats or you decide to go balconies to capture your other 300 seats, it would, it would be pretty expensive. Um, it's difficult to, to answer that question because you'd have to then plan to put the infrastructure in now because you couldn't come back and put that in. Then you're talking about four or five million dollars, I would think, for 300 seats. I mean, the economics wouldn't be there, plus all of the inconvenience and the, the other troubles that you would have. You'd have a lot of infrastructure to put in now, elevators and stairs. You'd have to put a lot of that in now or at least plan for it now. So it would be... Um, I'm not even sure how much you would save now if you just didn't build it. Um, we've, we've had some experience with second floor additions, giving a client a price of, say, 800000 in 1996, and six years later, it's $2.4 million. Three times the cost, and that was an office building, and we planned for it. So pretty expensive. So putting the infrastructure in now, planning for the additional 800, additional 300, would make more sense than to build a 500. If you eventually wanted to get to 800, that would I would say that'd be the only way you'd be able to do it. If you if we were building the footprint for 500 and you would and then we want to go to 800, it would you know those extra 300 seats would not be premium seats for sure. You know they would be. Um, you know, they would be, you know, sides, you know, you'd maybe go up if you had enough volume space, but it, it would not be, you'd have to plan it out and you'd spend the money planning it out. Would you go to the, the bottom line on phase two, please? 5.736. So we're up at, call it seven if we moved the black box. Well, yeah. not, not quite seven, but probably like one. We had to add one point three. No, so right at seven. Right, I would think that's right. Okay. Doctor Roban, would you approach the microphone, please? <coughs> How does the How does the yes. concept of a of a black box along with phase two, um, how does that suit your program since you get classroom spaces, you get a, an admittedly small performance space with the ability to uh, use a theater space somewhere in the district, plus, I mean, possibly even we could we could budget money for you to, to rent an auditorium. How does that serve your, your program? Um, I think the main concern um, of course, with the space issue is actually dance because you mentioned the dance suite. The dance needs the most space of anyone. Um, so, like if we're using a classroom at Como High, you're talking about really knocking down a wall. I mean, they're already hitting the walls at Lafayette High in the gymnasium. Um, and so, the auditorium has a 4,000 square foot stage. And so, if necessary, the dancers could rehearse in there when it, you know out of the smaller classroom. Um, and so. That would solve their need. And so you're saying doing the teaching spaces with the black box and then later doing an auditorium are the reverse of that? Am I mistaken? I thought they had a dance suite in phase two. That's in phase one, correct? Two. It's in phase two. Scroll up on the computer, okay. Dr. Robin. So we switch the names again from phase? Well, I'm telling you, it's going to be phase, That's phase delta phase pretty two. soon. Okay. But at some point, it, we, I think we had switched to where the auditorium yeah. would be built second and then... So we were talking about changing that, or people had mentioned that. So I was well, it's, well, it's kind of what we're talking about now is building the auditorium second. But if but the this what's on the screen now it appears are 
classroom spaces plus what what mr crozier said was 100 steep black box okay. you know, something that you could have small strings for sure right sure for small performances yeah. small performances uh with you know we get your larger performances theater li theater wise you know we we've mentioned the several auditoriums around the, the district um so take a look take a second to look at it i know it was difficult to see on the screen uh i was just your initial impression on if we did phase two first how that would serve your your program on a day-to-day -day basis strings mm -hmm. guitar suites piano mm -hmm. music storage rooms to the band Right. So we're looking at the teaching spaces we mentioned last time, plus the black box with the auditorium later. Is that correct? That would be my guess right now. That's certainly what I'm looking at. Well, I mean, you know, I think uh, either one serves purposes for a while. And, um, you know, money is not my area of expertise. If it was, I wouldn't be a composer, and I definitely wouldn't have a doctorate degree in music. Um, and so that's just the truth. Um, so, I mean, you I know. I know money. That's why I'm asking you. Well, yeah, questions. I know. That's. Well, maybe you should have met me about three degrees ago. <laughs> Told me about student loan interest. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, that they, they each serve a good purpose. And obviously, economically, it's impossible to do both at the same time. And so I imagine one of them is more cost effective than the other. And so obviously, you know, if you're looking at money, the least, you know, one that costs the least is probably the best option. Uh, given the current state of you know economics in in, in our state um i, I think we can well, i'll give you this much all right so like you're right we're probably not gonna be able to do both at the same time yeah and for me seven or ten i, I know this is it's not that big of a difference seven or ten but what i'm looking at is not well let's just do what's least i'm looking what what serves the students on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. and so i'm asking you for your professional opinion how does this help your program on a day-to-day -day basis? I understand that the theater provides some benefits. I understand that the classroom spaces provide benefits. Which one provides the best benefit for the dollar amount spent? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, well, that's um, why you have the doctorate. Oh, well, yeah, not, not in tough questions about that. Um, but I, I think um, when you're looking at, say, the auditorium as the second phase and, and renting spaces, um, I mean, you're looking at cost-benefit analysis, and that that's you know that that's you I'm looking, um, for the, I'm looking for the benefit i've got the cost okay well the the benefit of you know if, if if you were to build the auditorium first then then the performing side of the performing arts as far as to the public and the community is is, is you have a face to the program um you don't have to worry about um trying to book a space and finding the time to do your christmas concert in november because there are no you know december availability and so there just aren't a lot of actual fully functioning performing arts venues in lafayette um, and so the auditorium side is, is is the community side and so the community comes to it it's part of the home of the program they see it as part of the school um, their kids are always performing there it's 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 their home um, and so you've got that sort of attachment to the auditorium phase um, the teaching spaces, of course, are, are, are better fit to the size of the program. So regular classrooms are really not built to house, you know, 30 dancers twirling up and down. It uh, becomes kind of a danger issue. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of like choosing between your own two children. And so for, for me, the, you know, uh, either one will do what it needs to do until the other one's built. Um, each, each one you know, presents its own set of difficulties. One's a day-to-day -day difficulty if you don't have the teaching spaces. Every day you run into this problem of not having enough room to rehearse or uh, annoying your neighbors who are English teachers because they're hearing, you know, rock guitar going on when they're trying to do an EOC test prep. And so I don't know how, how used to the, the Como teachers are to, you know, all the noise that we bring. Um, we're used to it. Um, and so that might be, you know, a concern to, to other teachers. Uh, the auditorium is, is the whole performance thing. So it's not a day-to-day -day thing necessarily. You're rehearsing in there, but it is the front of the program. And so um, I guess you're just really looking at um, your vision of the program. And so my vision is eventually both are done and everybody's happy and the program's growing. It's part of the community. Um, your side of it, you know, uh, is to figure out um, you know what you think works best in the situation that we're in because um, obviously y'all want the best for everybody I want the best for everybody um, and so it, it's half a dozen of one or the other 
Um, and so, you know, I can't really choose because um, they both serve a need. You know, they both serve a need. It's like, do I, you know, fix the air conditioning in my car or in my house? Well, probably well, the house. I was really hoping you'd be Solomon here, but it's, it's oh, okay. Well. <laughs> no, I guess my, my ultimate question is, does, does the black box do for you what Mr. Crozier said? where you can have small performances. You can right, right, depending on the size of it. And so, for instance, you know, the guitar concerts are smaller and the theater productions, you know, theater, they do multiple showings. So they do five performances. So you're not going to get 800 people at every performance. So that's why the box, black box is sort of invented and it's, it's mobile and you can reshape it. Uh, we could probably fill that up easy with guitar concerts. Uh, strings usually get three to 400. So, that, you, know, you know, they might have to do it twice or split the concerts in half. It would definitely at least give technical support, lighting and sound work for the students and media and, and lighting and stuff. Um, and so uh, if the black box weren't part of that, I think it'd be a harder sell. Um, but I, I definitely think adding the black box to it allows, you know, if you have to choose between, you know, that's probably the best of the options. Because um, then theater is taken care of, small rehearsals are taken care of, and just the big more community events, you know, or have to, are harder to plan. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Dr. Chessel. Would you be able to pull, would you be able to pull that phase back up for me? Sure. How many square feet is that dancer studio or the dance suite? Uh, all the, the studio itself is 4,200. The whole suite is right at 5,000. So you've got an off, a couple of office spaces in dressing rooms and a storage, or one office space, storage and dressing rooms. Uh, let me ask staff a quick question. Will there be any empty classrooms? Once we rezone, repopulate, will there be any, any empty classrooms? I'm not trying to shortchange the kids, but uh, I'm just. He has all these, all these places that got scratched out. Gotcha. We're reusing existing, existing space. space. It, I think yeah, that answers your question right there. Some of these already exist or we're going to repurpose we didn't a few. Require it or yeah, we repurposed a few things. This was a this was part of the way that we cut down on the cost of this particular okay. for band and choir. That's correct. Like for dance. Uh, was there anything that could possibly suit a dance suite if we knocked down walls? We didn't study the the floor plan as much as ASW did, um, but I, I know in our last discussion with the facilities committee. Um, that was something that it was thrown out to explore what, you know, what spaces could be or could not be reutilized. Right. I think what we'll find in, in is the shape of the space and the, the shape of the space has a lot to do with how it gets used. So a, a long narrow room might be good for a certain function and a square room like this might be good for a certain function. So we'd have to see what it is that we were trying to repurpose it to. Um, we're looking at the same thing for Lafayette High in its study and how to make some of those spaces work. It's about the current proportion of how we would teach. So I, I would think we could look at some of those uh, some ways to do that potentially. What I was curious about is if at the end of one particular wing Yes, knocking down a wall to join classes in one direction makes it makes it a rectangle, mm -hmm. technically speaking. But if we could knock down the wall um, going in the opposite direction mm -hmm. to to then take a classroom on the left side and a classroom right. on the right side, and then yeah, potentially, and then change the egress requirements for the hallway, right. you know, uh, with whatever space, space is next to it. I think that would be probably part of I think that's why this is such a living document mm -hmm. and such a mobile document that 
those are the kinds of things you could explore when you start getting into the mean potatoes of it. I mean, I know it, the information you would like for me to say, yeah, we certainly could do well, that, and this is where we do it. Uh, I would think that those things would be certainly on the table as, as we plan our way with, as someone would plan their way through that. And then what do you, what are we giving up to? You know, how many classrooms are we going to take up and are, are we going to find ourselves with a classroom shortage later on if we did that? I, I don't know. That would be what we would have to look at, you know, with the administration. I hope everyone understands. I'm, I wouldn't necessarily try and bump a set group of kids out of a classroom. But if, if something comes down to over a million dollars versus us owning something that we could put there on the grounds, mm -hmm. I mean, a cost of 30000 versus $1.6 million. That's, that's a that's difference. Where, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we have. And I know we're trying to get away from portable buildings, but if a portable building, even one, saves us the difference between we knocked down walls and made a dance studio and then made it suitable properly. I mean, they were flourishing at Lafayette High with using the space that they had, which wasn't intended for those purposes in the first right, place. So right. uh, if we could just take a look at that, then that would be my only concern. Mr. Bristow? So Mr. Guidry, uh, if we were, if we wanted to recommend phase two, um, and I helpfully pulled up the project listing from the August committee meeting. And we go to the one that has six million in it, which I think six million for Como, and we wanted to change that to seven was the only difference in that in that listing between plantation and between that one and the one listing, Como's cost at 12. Is the only difference the cost of the plantation project? Or the, no, we took a million out of Milton also, right? Tell me how, how, how the project list would let me, let me rephrase. Tell me how the project list would look if we wanted to put 7 million for Como as opposed to 6 or 12. Then uh, the allocation between uh, Milton and, and plantation. <laughs> Uh, would be adjusted by by a million dollars downward. Equally, so uh, we had uh, the way it's shown now. I believe it's pro rata, but it, in, in whatever manner the you know the committee chooses to okay. to distribute it. All right. Well, um, I, let me just mention one other thing. Uh, Tomorrow night's board meeting uh, will be reviewing uh, final budget revisions for fiscal year 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those revisions uh, is a provision to uh, transfer uh, two point, uh, I believe it's 2.3 million or thereabouts uh, from the general fund to capital self-funded construction uh, to to address uh, the Milton project. So depending on what happens there, it's possible that uh, you could take the million that's needed to get the six to seven. Uh, and with regards to, and I'm, I'm going, going by mem memory now, it, it, I'm sorry. It may it may have been an additional amount uh, to try to get it closer to uh, to eighteen eighteen and a half million. Uh, so I'm I'm sorry. There, there will be some funding available if the board approves it uh, to get uh, Milton closer to the uh, original amount, and that million uh, to get the six to seven would could be distributed between uh, Milton and and Plantation in whatever manner uh, the board wishes. So uh, the the final budget revision, I think, gets uh, gets us closer to the to the 19 million. Uh, In the final budget revision that we're reviewing, it's for fiscal year 16. Correct. Not fiscal year 17. 
Uh, it's the fiscal year 16, but by if the board were to approve that transfer, the funds go into capital and become available in 17. Sure, sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Santini, I could, if it would help, I can make this adjustment in the morning, circulate the document. Well, to uh, you know, uh, I'll tell you from my point of view, I don't, um, I prefer to just give you guys a budget and say, hit that, hit that budget. You know, I, I'm not going to try to tell anybody what you need to build or what, I mean, you saw how long I had to, to talk with Dr. Roban just to figure out if a black box was necessary. I don't think you guys need my input on any of this, but uh, we are responsible for spending the taxpayers' money and uh, trying to be responsible with it. So, um, with that said, I will um, make a motion that this committee recommends to the board to um, institute the Como High Performing Arts Instructional Spaces at $7 million with a reduction of the plantation project of $1 million. That the board changed the project listing for our bond issuances to add Como High Performing Arts instructional spaces at seven million dollars and reduce the plantation project listing by one million. I, I, I think I think you're good with the, the most, yeah. Let's let's stay within that. Speak into the microphone, please. Thank you, sir. I was speaking with Mr. Santani, and I would really like to reassure ourselves. I asked him, how can we reassure ourselves that if we get to the grounds and we're at Como and if we, if we give a budget of seven million and we've got this dance suite where we can save 1.6 million possibly, if we can possibly break down some walls, I, asked, I was asking them how do we reassure ourselves that that occurs as opposed to, well, we've got seven million, we're gonna go ahead and build it in there. Not to say anyone's gonna purposely try and do it, but how do we reassure ourselves? And it was suggested to lower that to six million just so we can be sure that that occurs because if We've got some empty classrooms. We can repurpose those and make those just like a brand new dance studio. Because I mean, it's an existing structure. All we'd be doing is knocking out some walls and taking out what's in there. And then we could make it a dance studio. Same way we would be doing. Now that's it. Okay. Um, if you did want to make it six, that's, that's certainly fine with me. I wouldn't hold out too much hope though because the, the amount, the difference what I was when I was reviewing the the, the listing before, so the uh, band suite, I think was that's a looks like somebody scanned it. Uh, the band suite was nine thousand square feet, which in this version they're they're going to do some reuse. The choral suite was uh, looks like five hundred square feet. So you're talking about. 
pretty close to 10,000 square feet, which is a large, large. it's 100 feet by 100 feet. Um, you know, I think you, it's certainly our prerogative to go that way and, and I would be prepared to, uh, for a couple of budget revisions to this project, which is fine, right. which is I fine. Understand. It's the way we, it's the, the way we ensure that, that we stick to it. So, um, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Bruce Horn. If, if we if we find that the uh, six million does not work, do we come back and and put this on the table again for the seven million? And I, I understand which I totally agree. If we if we can utilize the space that's there, it would save us money, and I would agree. But do we come back in with that other one million dollars to make it seven? If he cannot find the space available. Does that happen? Yeah. Absolutely. I assume so. I mean, Probably. yeah, it would be a, it would, I mean, the, the project listing has changed several times since its inception as we have moved from estimates to actual costs. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same process. Dr. So, Chasson, if, if I could just, from a, uh, experience in the campus over there yes sir he certainly knows yeah on the band side of the campus mr bordelon uh, there is the old jewelry academy room is a finished room that it has its own standalone ac unit it's it's a long narrow room that you're describing they're they're currently using it for ag that is a classroom that could potentially be made into a dance studio I mean, they'd have to make adjustments for ag but uh on the side of the campus where they're talking about an auditorium i'm certainly not a structural engineer that has traditionally been the hallway for the math and english core classes so and i guess to a certain extent they had band and chorus and the music on one side of the campus to keep them away from the traditional core classes kind of like dr roban mentioned right. to kind of separate the sound but just off on the surface there probably is a space available for a dance studio without huge construction. Okay, that's what I was. That's what I was kind of hoping for, and I'm sure you would know better than anyone. You want to make it six? You want to make it six? Yeah, I, I would prefer to make it six. Ms. Dorothy, I'd like to change my motion to six million and leave the plantation line as is. So the motion actually becomes to just add Como Performing Arts at six million. Plantation. Did I say Milton? I meant plantation. Okay. Three, four, none against.
right, well, that passes, and we will move on to item number two, the general fund budget revision request for restoration of 25% cut in per student allocations. Duh. Mr. Guidry. Yes, yeah, so this particular uh, agenda item references the 25% uh, reduction in per student allocations that are that are made to our schools. Uh, it's $57.50 per student for elementary, $60.50 for middle, and $61.50 for high school. Uh, these per student allocations are uh, part of the uh, ado budget adoption process uh, and the one for this year for fiscal year 17 as well as last year there was a reduction of 25 percent uh, in order to uh, that was one of the reductions to balance the budget and so this particular agenda item would, would restore that uh, 25 percent reduction which has an estimated cost of about four, roughly $436,000 with the offset uh, being an increase to property tax re revenues uh, generated by roll forward of property tax millage if that, that in fact uh, is approved uh, at tomorrow's uh, special board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Gidry. Do we have any questions from members of the audience? Do we have any questions from members of the committee? Go right ahead. Help me understand this a little better, Mr. Uh, Gidry. I, I'll be honest with you, I truly don't understand it. These are per student amounts, mm -hmm. uh, the 57.50. Uh, sixty dollars and fifty cents for middle and sixty one fifty for high school uh, those amounts are multiplied by each school's MFP count the number of students they have as of 10 1 and uh, that total dollar amount is made available to each school administrator each school principal who in turn provides us with a detail a detail of how they would like to budget that allocation uh, maybe instructional material and supplies uh, it may be travel uh, just a, uh, about 15 to 20 different budget categories uh, and based on the needs specific needs of their school uh, they, they detail out that allocation so that total that total allocation was reduced by 25% Hmm. Mr. Broussard, do you have any questions? I move that we uh, that we defer this item until we start our budget process in January. Are there any questions from members of the audience before we vote? Mr. Hidalgo. If I can ask Mr. Guidry, um, how would this impact deferring it? How does it impact its uh, potential effect on the start of, of next school year? What I mean is, I understand that there are different things that um, approving this could accomplish. We know that we have fundraisers out of the wazoo and we could certainly lessen that burden on our system. I also believe that it's a nuisance to have all of these class fees every year. As a parent, write a check for this class fee, write a check for this class fee, this class fee. You know, we could eliminate or reduce class fees with this. Would, would, would postponing this affect us from being able to potentially address some of those issues for next school year? Uh, by uh, <clears throat> by deferring to the, the budget process in January, uh, I guess it, it, this would be the budget process for the next fiscal year? For this fiscal year 18, yes, sir. Is that, cor is that correct? I'm yes, sorry. sir. So uh, basically the, uh, 
consideration of restoration of these funds would would be made in in the next uh, for next fiscal year. We would we would consider it at that point in time. With regards to class fees and fundraisers, uh, class class fees are, are more geared towards uh, supplemental educational experiences. In other words, the general fund provides the the, the basic and uh, the class fees allows an expansion uh, of, of some of the uh, uh, instructional experiences that the, the students are exposed to. So if if these funds were restored, uh, I would think that uh, a reduction in fund, it, it's more likely that it would go towards a reduction in fundraisers uh, more so than, than class fees, because class fees can be reduced simply by removing those supplemental uh, extra extracurricular or supplemental projects, so to speak, uh, that enhance you know the the instructional process. For example, you know if, if you're talking about family and consumer science, home economics, uh, it may be a, a meal, an additional meal they get to cook uh, that that class fee would cover over and above what's being provided uh, through the general fund. So it would be something along those lines. So I think if it's restored, we'd see probably see more uh, along the lines of a reduction in fundraisers. Mr. Doug, I'll be happy to change it to be recommend that the board defer instead of us deferring. Uh, no, I just wanted to ask so that we can maybe address some of those nuisance areas or what I perceive to be nuisance areas uh, within the system. But, you know, what the committee's recommendation is what it is. I, I wanted to get that answer from him. Though. One person's nuisance is another person's ownership. Got you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Guidry, uh, if, you, if you could indulge me for a second. Uh, the 25% reduction that we've seen for the previous year and this year, um, were principals aware to, excuse me, did they have the ability to look at what they would have gotten money-wise from this particular situation? And they they used the fundraisers to try and compensate? Like, Because when I think of fundraisers, I think of a fundraiser as, okay, the band is going to do a fundraiser for the band or the basketball team for the basketball team. Are, are these school-wide fundraisers that – that well, Mr. Craig. I'm sorry. That might be a better question for Mr. Craig. You were so, principal. So the yeah. So the thought was, it, it absolutely doesn't solve the fundraising problem for the high schools and the big programs. You could return all of the allocation to Como and give it to Band, and it wouldn't be enough. Wouldn't, wouldn't but be. in terms of the elementary and middle schools, at least some of the middle schools, it does away with thought is it does away with the need for the school-wide fundraisers at the elementary and middle schools and the the accounting associated with those fundraisers it's it's a huge burden on the on the school clerical right. and the central office admin uh, staff uh, but absolutely you're still going to have fundraising in the high schools for the bigger programs okay um. I keep I keep missing you, Miss Sam. I, I see Mr. Craig. I couldn't see you, Miss Sam. When you were principal of Boucher, um, would you try and use the fundraiser to compensate? Did you know? And I know that's a tough question because you're in the position you're in now. Did you know? Oh well, we're not getting ten thousand dollars. Were you aware of the actual figure amount? And you guys would try to supplement that. Yes and yes. Okay. Uh, we would get our the paperwork, and it would show the amount that of a reduction that we were going to experience. Okay. Um, for example, Boucher, the two years I was there, we did three school-wide fundraisers, one in the fall, one in the winter, okay. one in the spring. Crawfish but they were always for a purpose, and one purpose was the new curtains for the cafeteria. The stage was deplorable, I so remember. we got new curtains to really dress it up. So the fundraisers could that money the ten thousand dollars that you're looking at there the 25 percent reduction could that have been used for the curtains absolutely okay and last question would be minus 25 percent mm -hmm. 
Mr. Craig and Ms. Samick, were you guys always successful in reaching that gap with that fun, with the fundraisers? Well, it's kind of like the board discussion with the auditorium. You you get a dollar amount and you prioritize what your needs were and you make it work or you defer it for another year and another project. But yeah, typically you no, you can't get everything you want. You prioritize it and do what you can a little bit at a time. Okay. And, and I agree. The the difference I think for the two schools I was principal at is that I had Title I funds. So I may I couldn't use Title I funds to for curtains. curtains. So that's why you had to identify what fundraising activities you wanted to do for your improvements on your campus and then you supplement the educational resources with your title one budgeting is the same at all levels any more questions mr broussard well, we'll go ahead and vote miss dorothy Three, four, none against. All right, motion passes. We'll move to item number three, the general fund budget revision request for moving all employee categories from instructional other salary schedule to teacher salary schedule. Mr. Guidry? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when we're working through the pro process of uh, identifying which employees were eligible to receive a uh, 14th check from the 2002 sales tax fund, uh, there was a a thousand dollar increase that was given i think it was back in maybe november of 14 and at that time what that did was uh, for those individuals who were not eligible because they were uh, uh because of their uh, employee category and the dep not being included in the administrative uh, plan that sort of uh, identified the eligible uh, employees uh, they were moved to an instructional uh, salary schedule, which in essence was the new teacher salary schedule, the teacher salary schedule uh, that included the $1,000 increase minus the $1,000. So in essence, we had uh, several employee categories that were moved from the teacher salary schedule to this instructional salary schedule. What this particular uh, item, agenda item does would be to, although the, wor the wording says to move the employee categories from instructional salary schedule to the teacher, uh, I would propose that uh, the, if, if the committee is in agreement that the motion read that the uh, instructional salary schedule be increased to agree with the teacher salary schedule. And, and the reason for that is uh, those, em those employees that are paid off of the teacher salary schedule, uh, it makes it a very, it facilitates the processing of the 14th check. If we move these employee categories back to the teacher salary schedule, then we're back in the same situation where we're going to have to go in and write an inquiry that uh, inquiry that basically pulls them out uh, and just lends itself for something to get overlooked so uh, if the committee is in favor of this particular agenda item that would be uh, to, to increase the instructional salary schedule by a thousand dollars I would propose that uh, it be done in a, in a manner in, in that we would main, maintain the instructional salary schedule uh, separately it would agree with it, the amounts in the teacher salary schedule, but it would allow us to distinguish between those employee categories that are to receive the 14th check and those that are not. And, and the cost, estimated cost of increasing those employee categories by that thousand dollars per year is uh, $242,002. Thank you, Mr. Gedry. Do you have any questions from members of the audience? Mr. Cole. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Jonathan Cole, uh, President of the Lafayette Parish Association of Educators. Um, to be honest with you, um, this particular item uh, has been met with uh, a pretty split house uh, from our leadership team and executive committee uh, over at uh, LPAE. And, um, you know, looking at, at both sides of this particular argument with what Mr. Guidry has said, um, there's a couple of concerns. And as the cost benefit guy, you know, we may want to offer you some assistance in that regard. Um, First, there are the anomalies uh, between and from, from one side. There are anomalies that have been reported to us from administrators who have made, or, or teachers who have made the switch to administration, in other words, the newer administrators, that there is a, a pay uh, difference, something that results is, you know, whenever a person makes the switch to administration. Uh, the second, again, as a, as a benefit, is that you have a streamlined kind of scenario uh, when you have one uh, pay scale, one uh, salary schedule. On the other hand, uh, there's a concern because you know teachers are not the only education uh, professionals now. And when you look at the list, you know the uh, it's a much more complicated offering of services. So, you know, for purposes of of taxes, for purposes of you know uh, class counts and things, uh, what's defined as a teacher and what's defined as another professional. When you have a, a two-scale system like this, you delineate who's a teacher and, and offering a classroom service and who's offering another service. So that's something to consider there. Uh, and in addition, administrators uh, and other professionals listed um, are under more, and maybe we could get clarification, more detailed contractual obligations. And that, uh, you know, and, and with regard to like a, a step increase or an indexing could be sp spelled out in a contract. Uh, and so that's just, I don't know what else we can, we can offer you in that regard because uh, this particular one has been, a, been met with a lot of discussion. Uh, and so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, it's, um, it's, been, it's been pretty evenly divided. What are some of the anti-positions? I beg your pardon? Uh, I, th I felt like you only gave us the benefits. What, what are some of the cons? Those, those were the cons. The, 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 so the, the benefits were the Oh, the, you kept the first prefacing two. them with benefits. Okay. Right. So I was trying to give you, you know, Bene both Benefit sides. From, from the other side. Okay. Right. I got you. So I got you. Uh, anyway, that, that's, that's basically what Thank I have for you. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just make a general comment in that um, I think it, this is probably a good idea. It certainly... I like your idea better than moving them all to the teacher salary schedule, Mr. Guidry, is keeping them separate and, and indexing it because I certainly as um, can appreciate the awkwardness that might arise after, and I'm not saying it happens now, but as we move three, four, five, six years into the future from the separation of these salary schedules, you're going to find, especially at the high school level, I think, um, teachers that make more than their principal or certainly teachers that make more than their assistant principals. And um, that's always going to be an awkward relationship between uh, superior and employee. So, um, you know, and, and I mean, teachers get a raise, principals get a raise. You know, it's a it's a good management idea, I think. Um, that said, I do feel like it's the same kind of falls into the same category as the item before this, where I'd, I'd prefer to handle it when we have a better picture of the financial situation we're going to find ourselves in at the end of the year. So uh, Dr. Chasson, Mr. Brutor, do you have any questions or comments? These are my thoughts on it and granted they're just my thoughts. To me it seems as though this essentially gives folks a raise that weren't otherwise granted a raise when the tax passed. That's what it comes across as to me. So I just wanted to get clarification if possible. I mean, just with that statement, if if I'm on this side, if you're gonna say, well, no, that's not the case, I kinda would like to hear that because, I mean, a principal wasn't in the 2002 sales tax, but this is general, This is general fund money. Right, but I'm, I mean, essentially that's, that's what I'm, well, I mean, what I'm gathering, well, I sure. Think. What the the practical implication of this is that in the future, should we uh, vote to give a permanent raise out of the 2002 sales tax fund, we would subsequently be agreeing to give raises to everyone else that's on the instructional salary schedule out of the general fund, which in and of itself is not 
a bad idea. Not in this current economic climate, though. Is that is that what you're basically saying? Well, I'm saying that, I mean, should we give the raise and then come February find out that we're short? You see what I'm right, saying? I, I mean, there, there's. I think there's a, a time when we can make this decision that has more information and we can have a better handle on it. Like I, I mean, you know, like I said, this is the this is a good idea in my opinion. But it's do do we have the money for it right now? Okay. Uh, any anyone from staff? Could, yeah. I guess as a, as a rebuttal to what I'm basically asking about I guess I would chime in that we've got a fair number of administrators that are ending their careers and and we're trying to develop leadership capacity for the future and I think Mr. Santani kind of mentioned that there really isn't an incentive for future leaders to, to get into administration because of the pay disparity or the compression in the two salary schedules and I guess, you know, whether we do it now or when we do the budget process, it's something we really need to consider because you know, we interviewed for probably 15, 20 vacancies this summer uh, at the administrative level, and the pool is, is getting small. There's not a lot of incentive to move up, and we really need to build that capacity for the future crop of administrators. I appreciate that, Ms. Gray. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, this is and has been a recurring question from principals. When will um, this board consider closing that $1,000 gap between those two salary schedules? It's something that they've wanted. They've articulated to me from the very first day I've been in the district. Uh, quite frankly, it's compression. It affects our ability to recruit uh, future applicants for administrative positions. It makes good financial sense that at some point in time in the past, the board did not have the general fund dollars to support that $1,000 increase by way of the 2002 tax. But at, that, at this point in time, we have the capacity uh, to close this gap. It in no way compels the board to grant a future raise based on the 2002 revenue stream and then subsequently be forced to add money to the instructional teachers instructional salary schedule but at this moment in time it closes that uh, gap um, I characterize this as a recurring sore in this parish that it's a question that has gone unanswered for nearly 15 months now when will this board consider closing this thousand dollar gap so I would urge you to uh, at, at a minimum bring bring this to the full board for consideration I, w I just want to say you're absolutely right Dr. Aguilar this is a recurring sore and the principals uh, definitely want to see us consider it and I, I sure hope that this gets um, all the all the consideration in the world I, I I think I will make the motion uh, when we're done with questions to bring it to the full board because um, while I, I don't think it's the time, I think it, you're right, it does deserve, they do deserve consideration. You know, changing the wording, changing the wording from the 2002 tax to the general fund, you know, it, it sounds good and, and Given these few employees a raise to a thousand dollars is great as well. I know we want to close the gap as far as salary and trying to attract the best out there, but I, I I'm just uncomfortable with constantly raising the salary of those who are making. I'm not saying a, a lot of money, but but those who are who have this health to salary versus those who work just as hard and may not be a professional in one sense, may not be a doctor of this and a doctor of that and a college degree, but we, we, we steady pushing those back. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not against anyone making 
making money but I'm for everyone making a decent salary and I just hope we'll find a way to compensate you know all our employees and not bring to the board in my estimation not bring to the board those few or many who are doing a great job teachers the principal and everybody else that employed by the school board is doing a great job but I you know if we if we can't do 100 uh, employees you know I, I think that's what we ought to try to look at trying to satisfy the needs of all our employees and difficult to do I understand we need to attract those leaders who can help us lead into into greatness but those who are uh, I don't want to use a negative choice of words but 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 everyone deserves to be looked at and I wish we would take the time to do that in before we make these uh, raises and bonuses and whatever else we decide to call it. See, see, Mr. Cole, we're split too. Well, I may be able to unsplit you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in looking at that, and uh, Dr. Aguilar said, when the 2002 tax was passed, the employees didn't, that uh, were not teachers, did not get a raise. We did. Uh, what happened is when the tax was passed, they told all of us that didn't qualify for the tax that we would get raises out of the general fund, and they did give it to us. And it upped everybody's retirement, and of course we were all older, so you know we, we had a lot of years. But uh, I know the, the problem that you're having now is that you have a teacher that has 30 years, and you have a new principal who may have 10 years of experience. Even with the increased principal salary, they will be making less than that senior teacher. That is a fact of life, and unless you pay that principal a lot more than what is on the salary scale, it's not going to happen. What happened back in the uh, 70s is there was a firm that came in here and set up salary scales for the administrators, the secretaries, there are different categories in all of this, and this is what we've been working on through the years, and we've got raises. The teachers have been getting that raise from the 2002 tax, and after that initial raise that we got, I don't think they kept giving it to administrators, but teachers kept get, getting it, and they were getting it from the state because the state does send the money to r increase the um, salaries of teachers. So it's, it's a fact of life that we're going to have to live with, and as the older administrators retire and the younger ones come on, they're going to get less, but if they stay long enough, they're going to make a lot more than we made. So it's a matter of are you going to stick with it and, you know, increase your salary or are you going to want to be compensated right away? When you don't have the money, you don't compensate. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sonia. Yeah. Uh as far as I agree with Mr. Broussard wholeheartedly and and as well Ms. Sonya as well, if we're facing a $5 million budget deficit, uh, for us to then be going in the opposite direction before we even get there, and I know before we even get there, it's already waiting for us. It's the elephant in the room. But as well, just guys, the, I, I know you guys, I know everyone in here has heard me say this plenty of times, but before you start doing this for principals and deans of students and curriculum coordinators and resource coordinators and lead teachers and strategists, you have to do the cafeteria workers, the janitors, the custodians, uh, secretaries, maintenance, whatever, whatever is that, that qualifying line that that everyone tends to not look at it's for me it's a lot of these folks have been saying i mean i mean dr aguilar and i'm not going to say this in a in a demeaning way but 15 months that they've they've been talking about it and wanting us to bring it up versus 15 years that that they've wanted us to 
just find a way to get them some more money. They don't make as much money remotely close as any of these categories here. So before I would even consider looking at these, um, I mean, a 30-year teacher deserves more money than a brand new principal. I mean, they're in the classroom with, with 30 kids. I would much rather see us find a way to address those particular categories. And I have to thank Mr. Santani because he charged me himself. He said, listen, before you go complaining about it, figure out a solution to it. Because it's easy to fuss about it, you know, scream at the mountaintops. Oh, well, what's going on? What about all these folks? Well, where's the solution? My, the problem that I have is that we keep coming up with solutions for everyone else. And I'm going to I'm gonna formally ask central office staff, my top four folks up there, can we come up with a solution for those particular categories, those, the, uh, the people who, if they don't show up, we don't, we don't open up school, kids don't get fed, school doesn't get cleaned. I mean, without them, it doesn't occur. I'm going to beg you guys, and this isn't the solution, but I'm mean, going to at least start the process. We've got to figure, we've got to figure this one out. Now, if you guys want to include all those categories in there, and I'm sure I'm leaving some categories out, tell me what that new cost is. I would consider that a whole lot more than just this, because just this uh, alone, I'm going to fight this tooth and nail when I'm sitting back in my, back in my corner. Well, we got a bigger one on the next uh, agenda item. So if, what, I, what I would be comfortable doing, and certainly feel free to not second it or disagree with this, I, I would move that we recommend that the full board defer this until budget process begins in January, just to give the, give the principals a chance to come and speak about it and, and make their feelings known. Because I, I would consider this a priority. I would consider your suggestion a priority to, right. to make sure that our employees don't have to undergo another year of of no increase to their salary to cover any increase in cost of living so that'll be the motion that the full we recommend that the full board defer this until the budget process in january second. seconded by mr broussard miss dorothy are there any comments from members of the audience any further comment dr chasson mr broussard We'll vote when you're ready, Ms. Dorothy. Three, four, none against. All right, motion passes. Item number four, general fund budget revision request to fund salary step increase and pay for performance increase. Mr. Gidry, do you have uh, something for this? Uh, this agenda item uh, refers to the uh, the salary step increase and pay for performance increase uh, that was not funded uh, in the adopted budget uh, and uh, introduces it as a separate agenda item for board consideration to, to fund 
uh, in the current year, for the current year. Does this item include every employee? Is this the one that was five hundred dollars for everyone? Uh, it may be a little less than five hundred, but yes, it, it it's based on the salary schedule. Uh, the uh, in increases provided for in the salary schedule. And does it include the the job categories that Dr. Chassel and Mr. Broussard referenced? Uh, yes, sir, it does. Okay, thank you. That said, and I'll, I'll take comment. We'll, we'll make a motion that the full, we recommend the full board defer this until the budget cycle in January. Seconded by Dr. Chassel, Ms. Dorothy. Do we have any comments from members of the audience? Please, Mr. Cole. Thank you again for your indulgence, Mr. Chairperson. Um, the financial realities of what's going on in our district and around the state continue to resonate uh, across, um, you know, across our community. And um, you, you know, again, this is one of those divided kind of issues. And uh, looking at it from, you know, from the different sides. Again, I'll be uh, make an effort to be more clear on the the different benefits and cons, so to speak. Um, Going back to July, um, LPSS requested a waiver with Bessie with regard to class sizes and a couple other things with relation to classroom duties, including things like instructional focus periods and the like. Um, and so looking at, at classroom professionals and those offering those services, uh, you're seeing an increased workload. Uh, and so, you know, more work, perhaps more pay and with regards to that. Um, but on the other hand, again, the, the financial issue is, is one, the numbers that, that you've mentioned on the floor uh, continue to be something that are on people's minds. Uh, I would just or urge the board to, uh, uh, to think about, uh, again, what Dr. Shaw saw on the questions you're asking with regard to, to folks who have gone quite a while without a pay raise, that we don't, uh, we don't neglect them in terms of their needs uh, and the service that they put in with regard to our uh, our district. But I would just like the, the committee and the board to consider uh, some of the additional things that have changed with regard to classrooms and far of what teachers are, are being expected to do, uh, as well as other professionals uh, in our district. So thank you. Absolutely. Now, and I'll make this comment in response. Um, we don't have the, or, or let's, say, let's say this, we do have the money now. Right, and we and we very likely will tomorrow night have additional tax revenue when we roll forward when we vote on roll forward rolling forward the millages. All we're saying is let's not make the decision yet, you know. And I think everybody up here supports the supports these ideas in in, in concept. What I would hate to see happen is for us to vote for an additional five points. 5.7, 5.9, I can't remember the number, million dollars in property tax revenue and immediately allocate it to recurring expenses and then find ourselves when we come come January that we're, we're 5 million in the hole and we have to, it'd be great. So people, the people that will still have jobs will have raises for sure. But there will, if we, if we do this and we find ourselves in that situation and there's no guarantee that we will, but if we find ourselves in that situation, we're going to be in the spot of having Given raises and laying off people all in right on the heels of actually collecting more in tax revenue. So I think my intention, all I'm saying is, let's wait three months. Let's wait three months until we get a picture of what sales tax revenue is going to do. Remember, we budgeted 7% decline in sales tax revenue. Supposedly, it is, it is nowhere near that thus far, which is, which is great news. It's, it's still a decline, but it's nowhere near what we budgeted. So hopefully in January we find ourselves with, a, with, with good fiscal responsibility in a, in a spot where we have anticipated the, the issues we may, we may encounter and we have the money to take care of our employees, to make sure that we're attracting leaders, to make sure that we can fill the positions that need filling. Because, you know, if we don't give cafeteria workers a raise and janitors a raise, when they leave, we're not going to be able to hire people because – we don't pay enough. I mean, it's a, as Miss Sonia said, it's a fact of life, you know. So um, I, it, that was a very long-winded way of saying the door's not shut. We're just, we're just gonna kind of hold off for. I'd like to see us hold off for just a little while. So, any other comments? We'll vote whenever you're ready, Miss Dorothy.
three, four, none against. The motion passes item number five, a general fund budget revision request to address damages repairs caused by the August flooding. Mr. Guidry. Yes, uh, this, this budget revision uh, would provide for uh, the estimated million dollars of repairs uh, that will not be covered by our insurance proceeds. Uh, although we anticipate that we will uh, be in, eligible for and receive FEMA reimbursement for a portion of that million dollars, uh, for the most part, we'll probably end up spending the money before it, it'll be on a reimbursement basis. So from a budgetary standpoint, we have to have the budget there so that we can uh, so that the repairs can be made and then once we become more aware of uh, what we can expect to be reimbursed for by FEMA we would come back to the board uh, finance committee with a budget revision to, uh, to bring into the budget the expected FEMA reimbursement so this is sort of this is step one of two uh, in addressing the, these repairs and renovations that need to be made do we have any questions from members of the audience? Do you have any questions or comments, Dr. Chesso? Then I move that we recommend the board adopt budget revisions to applicable expenditure line items in the general fund and capital projects fund not to exceed $500,000. And that we also recommend an offsetting budget revision to increase in MFP revenues. Three, four, and then against. Motion passes. Dr. Chesson. Question. Real quick. Mr. Guidry, anybody, what, was there an issue about what our insurance wouldn't cover, or is it based upon what we have to pay our deductible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have a, mil a million dollar deductible. So we're just parking the money there because the reimbursement may be slow coming in. By the way, the very very preliminary numbers we are now north of five million dollars worth of damage estimated for west side elementary school and still climbing is is there is there a better situation for you know what i can ask you guys after yeah, yeah. thank you dr aguilar all right if no one else has anything we'll uh, adjourn the meeting thank you